as a 12 year old and I spent a year in Tambaram uh, in Madras Christian College where my father was a Fulbright scholar. I went to a local school. I went to the Ninth Standard and uh, went through the whole, the whole year's education. I studied the South Indian drum, the Mridangam, and uh, went to Mailapur in Madras and studied with a maestro and learned Aditala and Ta Tari Tari Kita Tiku Taka Tari Kita and things like that. Uh, and I also had uh, the opportunity to travel quite a lot about uh, across the, the subcontinent. We went to Kerala, we went to Mysore, uh, we also went to Kashmir, uh, stayed in a houseboat. Uh, this was 1964, so it was possible to visit Kashmir without, without worries. And I remember uh, uh, all sorts of things because I was old enough to, uh, you know, to, to not just uh, go to school but to have a sense of what uh, the differences were between my school here, my school there, and uh, it was a momentous year also in American history. That was the year that JFK was assassinated, and I remember hearing about that from a headline uh, in the Hindu that we got uh, the day after. It was the year that the Beatles uh, uh, made their break in the United States, and I remember reading about that in, uh, in the newspapers as well. But more than anything else, I just became uh, uh, enamored by, fascinated by, uh, by India, by uh, the issues uh, that it was confronting, even politically. This was, of course, uh, the last year of Nehru's life. Uh, and although I didn't know it, I only found out that Nehru died when I was on a ship going back to, to the United States. I had a sense of the importance of Nehru, and in particular of the importance of Gandhi, about whom I read uh, a number of books at the time. Uh, I also, uh, you know, as a kid, so I had a lot of fun chasing around in the jungle and uh, trying to find leopard cats and even snakes and, and the like. So it was, it was just a very evocative year. Uh, and of course the experience studying the drum meant that I learned something about Carnatic music and, uh, and, and that was a, opened up a whole world of musical experience that had been unknown to me entirely. So when I went back to the States, I mean I went back, I went back to see my friends, I was in the ninth grade, uh, nothing changed except that I had this, uh, this kind of fascination. Uh, and so every time I was given an opportunity to write a term paper, whether on a course on religion or a course in history or a course in politics, I did some research on India. India continued to be uh, part of my world. The fascination absolutely lasted. I remember writing a paper about the philosopher Shankara and trying to understand differences between monism and dualism and qualified dualism and, uh, and see contrast between that and the history of Hellenic philosophy and other things when I was in high school. But I went to college uh, uh, in part uh, because I went to a college where I could study the Mridangam, uh, but of course also at a time uh, when the U.S. was getting more and more involved in Vietnam. Uh, and so Asia became important in a different kind of way in American life uh, at that point. And so, in a way, India became not just a place of interest, but it became a kind of counterpoint or a place where the experience of the U.S. engaging, uh, obviously, a very different part of Asia and a very different, uh, in a very different way, uh, nevertheless uh, uh, was, uh, what shall I say, I mean, it, 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 it was a point of contact. It was a point of reference. Uh, and so, increasingly, uh, I started uh, reading about the history of nationalism in India. Uh, the history of anti-colonial struggle, uh, and of course um, uh, made an effort to understand why it was that America was engaged in what seemed to be, at least from the point of view of the student movement in the U.S., a colonial war of its own, even though we were not an imperial nation. Well, first of all, Berkeley, like a number of universities in the U.S., has a long history of being connected to India, both in terms of students and faculty who came from India, uh, studied there, taught there, but also in terms of the study of India and the study of South Asia more generally. It was one of the four major centers for South Asian studies, for Indian studies in the period after World War II. Uh, and it has been a center for scholarship, including uh, in that part of Indian studies that uh, speaks particularly to me because it's one of the few places in the United States where you could study Tamil. Uh, so it has a long history of engagement. Now, of course, uh, we're here uh, to think about things that go beyond South Asian studies, and we're trying to make connections 
uh, with universities here, with, uh, uh, with different individuals, uh, both inside uh, university worlds and outside, to see what kinds of collaborations might be possible. I recently moved to Berkeley from Columbia, and while I was at Columbia, I worked on their global strategy. And one of the things that we did at Columbia was to build a center, an office in Mumbai. Uh, and, uh, and that launched, I think, a new kind of example of global engagement that different universities are now using in different parts of the world, including here in India. I understand that the University of Chicago just That's recently opened an office here in Delhi. Delhi. Hmm. And they followed very much the same kind of model that we established uh, at Columbia. So at Berkeley, I'm trying to figure out what would be the best mode of engagement for us as a university. We're a little different than many of the other universities. We're a public university. We have a particular obligation to the uh, citizens of the state of California. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it doesn't matter, matter whether you come from Berkeley, California, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, or uh, Mumbai, Delhi, or Chennai, uh, you're part of a new global world. And the importance of India, uh, both in respect to that world and certainly for the United States, has only grown over the years. So everybody in university administration is thinking about what would be the most appropriate way uh, to better engage opportunities for students, faculty, for research, uh, for teaching, for alumni, uh, uh, how to better engage in a, in a global way. And there's no accident that a lot of university administrators are here in Delhi exploring different kinds of options. Well, of course, India has been uh, a place where great universities were built up in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and I, of course, spent time at one of those college campuses, which was a great college, Madras Christian College. Uh, I've had uh, uh, friends and even family. My wife uh, grew up in India, and mm -hmm. she went to Alphonston College in, in Bombay. Bombay hmm. Uh, uh, we have uh, relatives, therefore, who've gone to Presidency College Calcutta, to St. Stephen's Hindu College, St. Xavier's in Mumbai, as well as other colleges across India. So I followed higher education here, both through the major universities and through some of its most uh, prestigious and elite colleges. Uh, what's been, of course, very interesting in the United States is that uh, first we used to get a lot of Indian students who would come as graduate students. Mm -hmm. They would do postgraduate work in the sciences and engineering and medicine but increasingly also in the social sciences and humanities, and certainly in my field. Uh, I teach uh, in the departments of history and anthropology, and over the years I've had increasing numbers of students who actually came from here to do their graduate work in the U.S. and get their PhDs, whether they stayed on there or came back here. Increasingly, we're having, of course, uh, like other uh, major colleges and universities in the U.S., more and more students come to do their undergraduate studies. Mm -hmm. Used to be if they went abroad, they would go to England, now many come to the U.S. And they come to Columbia, where I taught before. They come to Berkeley. They go to uh, lots of other uh, places in the U.S. as well and study all kinds of things, of course. One of the things that I've been concerned about is whether or not they're coming. Well, we love it when they come, come. and we love them to come to our universities and be part of our but university communities. But is it because the opportunities for study here simply have gotten uh, less open, uh, less compelling? Uh, and so what is it in the environment of undergraduate studies and higher education that is part of global shifts in terms of the choices that students make. So every time I've come back to visit uh, over the last 10 years, I've met with university leaders, I've met with community leaders, members of government, I've met with the uh, Minister of Education, Kapil Sibol, I've met with a variety of people who have been interested in, in creating different kinds and new kinds of relationships with American universities. But I've seen a big shift here. And the biggest shift, I have to say, in the course of just the last few years has been the recognition on the part of many university leaders, but also members of, uh, of the Indian community, okay. for the need uh, to do something in the liberal arts. So there's something about the American model which is seen as important, not just because it's in America, but because it actually opens up a kind of educational experience that increasingly people see as important uh, for, uh, for this nation, for this society. Well, I don't know if it's for me to say that, but I certainly think uh, that the, uh, the new efforts and new initiatives to create uh, different kinds of, of college experiences and university experiences uh, is, is a wonderful expression of, uh, of, of interest in the importance of higher education and the importance of having options and opportunities here in India and not just abroad 
uh, that can be uh, competitive, that can be as compelling as anywhere else, whether or not uh, some of these experiments end up being highly ranked in the Shanghai Jiaotong Index or not. I think it's wonderful that there's a recognition of the importance uh, of trying uh, new kinds of models. Now, of course, a lot of this is uh, done in the private sector. Uh, so there are new private universities that, uh, of course, are beginning to compete with public universities. I wonder what that competition will lead to. We've mm -hmm. seen the same thing happen in, in the United States, States where private uh, schools have become more and more uh, competitive and public schools have had actually less and less uh, state support. So I'm very curious to see how the landscape here will shift over time. But I think right now there's a kind of uh, sense of energy, a sense of uh, opportunity, uh, and a sense of you know, ambition uh, that I am just uh, 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 thrilled to see uh, and thrilled to uh, engage in the kinds of conversations, for example, that we've been having here uh, in Delhi this, this visit. Yeah, no, interesting. Well, I think uh, it's no great insight on, mine, on my part to say that uh, there are a growing number of students from India who come to study uh, everything. It uh, used to be there was a much more direct interest in either doing medical study or doing engineering. Uh, there have been a lot of Indian students uh, who have come to study the basic sciences as well, physics, mathematics, chemistry, uh, biology. Now you have Indian students studying philosophy, history, anthropology, sociology, as well as those fields. So there's, I think, a, uh, a much broader set of interests that uh, are reflected in the student body uh, who comes. And, of course, along the lines of what I was just saying, uh, there are students who come because they want to have uh, the elective opportunities that are part of the liberal arts curriculum. Uh, at the same time, of course, um, the worry I have is, uh, is about public disinvestment here in India as well as in the United States. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, it's no secret that uh, a lot of the information revolution that took place in the United States, especially in places like the Silicon Valley, uh, was done, uh, was done on, on with, the, with the educational uh, background of the IITs of India. Uh, and IITs were built up, of course, in the 60s, and they've been wonderful, uh, wonderful institutions of great, uh, great excellence. Uh, and so one worries about, you know, uh, the brain drain and, uh, and how that actually is reflected in terms also of, uh, of the present investment in higher education. Is it still being made in those kinds of fields that are so important for India at this, at this state of history? You know, I don't really uh, uh, um, like to urge students to study something in particular. I think uh, the liberal arts is great because it provides a broad and general educational basis on which then one can specialize. As far as the specialization that one, uh, uh, one makes, obviously that should be one's choice. There's no doubt that science, technology, engineering, uh, and mathematics, the STEM, STEM fields, are so important. And we know now that uh, 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 that education in, in, in science and technology is going to be critical, uh, not only for coming up with new kinds of solutions to problems that to yeah. some extent have been created by older technologies, the kinds of things around environmental degradation and, uh, and pollution and energy uh, consumption use and alternatives. Uh, so my interest is, 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 is in, in making sure that the STEM fields are, are well represented in terms of both uh, uh, top university opportunities here uh, and the choices that students make. But I do believe that it is a great thing when students can have the, uh, the opportunity also to have a liberal arts education. Right, well there's a lot of discussion about MOOCs both here and in the United States and it's very interesting because there was a little moment there when Coursera and Udacity and the like were launched in the U.S. when everybody thought that MOOCs were here, they were going to take over. Uh, we might not even need to have uh, residential college experiences anymore. Uh, and of course that turned out not to be true. It turned out not to be true because first of all it's very expensive to uh, begin uh, having a full menu of really top quality uh, online educational uh, uh, experiences. Uh, and it also is the case that a lot of students actually want to have residential experiences. They like the classroom. They learn from interaction not only with professors and graduate students but each other. 
So clearly there's going to be a much uh, more organic development of the uh, uses of online technology and education, both uh, in India and in the United States. At the same time, we know that online uh, uh, forums can reach new audiences in much broader ways, in villages and small towns where residential college experiences may not be, uh, may not be available. And so what we need to do, I think, together, and this uh, I think is a kind of global collaborative effort, is to find ways in which we can develop the very best and most appropriate online courses to be used by people who don't necessarily have the means to, uh, to have that kind of exposure otherwise. At the same time, it turns out that people who do best with MOOCs, who perform best with online courses, tend to have the experience of having gone to college, hmm. having been in uh, real classrooms. Uh, and so uh, I think we shouldn't fool ourselves that it will just be simple to find the magic formula that can engage people who don't necessarily have uh, a robust uh, educational experience to prosper uh, solely with online forms of education. Yeah, well, I think it's not about making women more ambitious. I think uh, that's not the problem. I think the problem often is finding ways to support women to succeed, uh, not just in advanced uh, uh, areas of education, but also uh, going on and becoming part of the academic workforce as well as uh, uh, in other careers, of course, as well. And oftentimes that's because we don't have adequate uh, maternity leave. We don't have adequate uh, child care that uh, actually allows uh, women to, uh, to have uh, children during childbearing years and have a career at the same time. So the kinds of choices often that have to be made are incredibly difficult uh, and they're choices that uh, end up uh, being much more onerous for women even when they're married to men who try to help out as best they can whether in the kitchen or around the house or with uh, uh, child care. So what I've learned in talking with uh, women students at Berkeley, both in uh, humanities and social science fields, in STEM fields, and virtually every area, is that we have to be much better at figuring out uh, what and how we can support women to make the choices that they really want to make that will allow them to, uh, uh, to realize the ambitions that they have but that often then become irreconcilable ambitions uh, when they don't have the kinds of support they need uh, to be able to uh, uh, do what they uh, uh, would like to do in life, uh, both in their personal lives and in their professional lives. <laughs>